Welcome to episode eight of Crash Course Cryptography. Today we're gonna to be talking about Diffie-Hellman and how to encrypt and decrypt things using the first asymmetric cryptographic algorithm that was out there. Now, if you're watching this and you haven't seen some of the early episodes, I just really wanna be sure that on this entire Crash Course series, you kind of really understand the basics because we're gonna dive right in and I'm gonna expect you to understand things like finite fields, cyclic groups, understand the basics of asymmetric cryptography because we're gonna be diving right in and we're gonna be finishing with quite some math where we kind of explain why it is really difficult to hack those things and why it's easy to calculate it when you know certain parameters. So without further ado, let's dive right in, let's go into the writing pad. We are part eight. We're talking about Diffie-Hellman. Great, now Diffie-Hellman is actually the first um, asymmetric cryptography that was out there. We discussed this last time. It's based on what's called discrete algorithms. And we're gonna look into how this works. Now it's very, very simple. We have a cyclic group and we have a generator point that is public and we have a large prime that we use as the modulus and that is also public and then two parties pick a private key and this private key is the exponent on this entire function. So if we look this up, then it basically means we have alpha, which is the generator point, to a, and a is the first private key. And we take this, we get a mod p. Now for reference, all the time when we use a lowercase, we this is the private key. In this case, a is the public key. Now we have the other party, Bob, and what Bob does is he raises the same generator point, in this case to lowercase b, and we get b mod p. Same thing, b is the private key, in this case of Bob, here we write Alice, Alice, and uppercase b is the public key of Bob. Now, here's where it gets very interesting, and we have what's called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. This is something that Diffie-Hellman key exchange, that's something that's very, very popular and, and very publicly used, and here is where it gets very interesting. What's gonna, what's gonna happen now between Alice and Bob, Alice goes to Bob, and Alice gives Bob this A, the public key. And Bob goes to Alice and also gives Alice his public key, which is B. And so what now happens is the following. We're basically taking large B, capital B, and add A. So this is what Alice is doing. And here is now where it gets very interesting. We get a so-called session key, and we call this session key K, okay? K is a session key. And that session key has to stay private. It's very, very important, private. What does Bob do? Bob goes, takes capital A that he got from Alice, that's a public key, and adds his private key. And what does he get? And this is a very, very important question now, and we're gonna look at some math before we fill this in here. What basically Alice does is she takes public key to the power of A. And all this really is, is the generator point. Now obviously we always have the modulus, so let's just leave this aside. With the modulus to the power, uh, with the generator point to the power of B and this to the power of A. Now what this really is, is the generator point P times A. This is just basic math. Now what is Bob doing? <laughs> Bob takes A 
to the power of b, which is actually alpha to a times b. And that equals alpha a times b. And because we have cyclic groups, this is the same thing. Because alpha to b times a is the same as alpha to a times b. This is just basic equivalence in math. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Bob also gets the same session key. Now, why is this really important? It's really, really, really important because we have what's called a discrete logarithm problem. If we have a generator point that's public and we raise it to a private key and we get a public key, mod p, it's very, very, very easy to go this way. But it is impossible or very, very difficult to go this way. So in this Diffie-Hellman key exchange, it's very safe for these parties to exchange their public key and add their own private key to the other party's public key and getting the session key. But for an outside observer, Oscar or Eve, it's impossible, even if this person would know both public keys, to attack and understand what's going to be the final session key. The way you can imagine this is if you have ever played Dart, right? If you have ever played Dart, and this is the Dart, and here's the bullseye, then let's say here, let's say we all start here, this is alpha, and let's say this is number eight. And remember on a Dart, it's not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's not. So if I tell you that my public key is eight, and this, the number of steps is my private key, if you wouldn't know how many things are in between the generator point and eight, how many splits are in there, it is impossible for you to know my private key. It's impossible. But if you know your private key now and you know exactly how many steps you would have to go forward, let's say you end up here at 10. And now this becomes the session key. It is impossible for an outsider to do the same thing because this person would need to know the amount of steps. Now, obviously, looking at the dart, you can count the steps. But remember that these numbers are that insanely large. They're thousands of bits, it is impossible to calculate because the calculation, the, just the counting, takes a lot longer. And I'm going to give you an example, uh, a very visual example to understand this even better. Now, the other party, and we're just going to use green, says, OK, I'm stuck here, or this is my first thing, and this is 16, this is public. And now I take the other amount of steps, and I end up here at 10 as well. So. Both parties end up ending at 10, but they're doing two different steps along the way. Because first here, this is what green does, right? This is private, green, private key green, and this is private key green. These are the same things. You don't know these amounts from the outside. You only see the final numbers here, but you don't know the amount of steps it took. And that is a very, very important um, feature of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And it's the same thing that gets used in asymmetric cryptography all the time. Now, how does it go forward from this? Well, it's very simple. Uh, we have two options now to go from here. Um, the first option is we have the session key. And we use the session key to get as, in, as um, advanced encryption standard. And it's just the session key. That's actually the most common version. Um, but then we have the second uh, option, and we don't need to use AES. We could go directly and use the, the session key directly. And that's called the L Gamal scheme, which we're actually going to be discussing when we talk about signatures a bit more detail. Um, because there, there's going to be something very interesting. We have this ephemeral uh, key called I that we need to add. Because if we'd always use the same session keys 
and we would use we would encrypt different stuff it would be possible to understand our private keys but so what i just want to discuss here is we're not going to go too deep in the algamal scheme it's not that relevant it's more relevant to understand um, the basic concepts of what is possible with uh, diffie hellman in that sense there um when we look at that then the question that always comes up right is and we kind of just grab this a bit is the crypt analysis now why is it so hard to back calculate something and why is it so easy to calculate something let's use a very, very familiar example if i gave you an amount and say and i'm going to use it in euros because we just have different kind of bills there right so we just use euros let's say we have let's say you have to pay me an amount okay and i know the amount but you don't know the amount and let's say the amount is this amount but let's say you wouldn't know that okay so i know the amount you don't now in order for you to pay me an amount you would have to test in cents every single amount so you would start with is it one cent no is it two cents no is it three cents no is it four cents no so you would have to give me each and every single amount and test it and in this case right you notice you would have to test three uh, thirty eight thousand um six hundred and sixteen steps in this case right because we have these cents now let's imagine you have the entire possibility of using all the euros then what you could do is you would need way fewer steps because you would have a 200 euro bill you could add a 100 euro bill to that then you would add a 50 euro bill to that you would add a 20 then you would add a 10 then you'd add a 5 now we're going to switch to coins you would have a 1 then you have 10 cents and then you have 5 cents and oh, sorry this is five cents not 50 cents and then you'd have one cent and you would have the entire flow and so if we're counting this now because that works because you know the amount you have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten steps so that is why if you actually know the amount it's a lot easier to calculate it than if you'd had to test every single thing. Now, how does this, is this applicable in this? And the reason it's very relevant in the discrete logarithm problem is also for elliptic curves, because there it's very similar when we have to add points. It works in a very simple way. So let's look, and this is actually what's called the square and multiply algorithm. So here's how this works. If you have to take a generator point and you have you'd have to take it to a certain amount let's say alpha right and let's say you would have to take it to the power of 80 you could say well isn't this the same thing as here because what I would have to do is this is this equals alpha times alpha times alpha and I need to do this 80 times isn't it the same problem as here where I would take 80 steps in this case to get there so isn't this insanely inefficient well no because what you could do is because you know 80 you know this number you could go and say okay alpha squared and this gives me an, an amount so this is the first step then i could go well alpha square times alpha square it's alpha to the power four that gives me another amount now i could go and say okay alpha four to the power of four times alpha to the power of four and this is alpha to the power of eight and so what i would come down with and it gets a lot easier is so here i have so this is basically to the power of two power of four power of eight power of 16 power of 32 power of 64 and obviously i have alpha here as well so i would need one step one step two steps three steps four steps five steps six steps and now i can go and i can just add those things together and in this case it's actually quite easy because all i would have to add together are those two because that gives me 80 so i would need 70 steps only to get to alpha to the power of 80. so for a calculator and when this gets humongously large numbers this is very very important to understand the square and multiply 
uh, square and multiply problem uh, algorithm because it shortcuts the calculation times by a lot. And it works the same way with money when you pay, but it's just you have to know the exact amount. So you have to know 80 in this case. Then you know, okay, the computer calculates this through and has it in this case in 70 steps versus someone who's trying to attack it has it in 80 steps. Now, because this is squared, the larger these numbers are, understanding how far you actually have to go is really, really important because it cuts time by a lot. And the reason this is important is not so much on the Diffie-Hellman right now. Of course, it's important there. But the reason I'm explaining this to you is because in the next episodes, we're going to be starting with elliptic curve cryptography. And there, this is very, very central to understand how adding points on a curve um, is actually very important if you understand how often you have to add versus you have to try every single thing. Now, but still, that key point, and this applies to RSA from the last episode, also Diffie-Hellman, it is still not clear, right? This is important. If the discrete logarithm problem So this is the DLP, has the same difficulty as the Diffie-Hellman problem. This is up for question because it, it would be possible that you could solve Diffie-Hellman in an easier way. And there are mathematicians who are trying to find this out. The same thing is in RSA, same story. There might be ways, and we're talking about cryptanalysis here, right? Don't forget that. There might be ways to attack this thing way more efficient and way better. For example, in RSA, there might be the same thing where you don't have to factor n. You, you could find better ways. And there are famous people who think this. And if you're really interested in this, you can read up on this and you can dig deeper. And, and maybe in 30 years, you're going to become famous by proving that the Diffie-Hellman problem is not, uh, the discrete logarithm problem is not the Diffie-Hellman problem. That maybe Diffie-Hellman is easier to solve, right? We don't know. The discrete logarithm problem, we definitely know this is the difficulty in how to solve this. In the DHP, it might be a bit easier or it might not be, right? So just wanna kinda highlight that and show that to you. So the key things before we move on, in the Diffie-Hellman pr uh, problem, that's based on the discrete logarithm problem is the understanding that it's very easy when you know a common generator point to go in a certain direction and get a public key out of this. You can exchange that key and you can encrypt similar how we've always done this. We're going to use, we're going to show also how uh, here's the encryption basically that you could either uh, run this. Where do we have this here? So we could either use it as a session key, we could use it in the Algamal scheme directly. Here, you would need to use an extra key that you always have to add um, in order to not allow back calculations. Um, but the main thing here is to understand when we move now to the next, and this is the third major group of asymmetric cryptography when we use the elliptic curve, the same principles apply. Just there, we're not talking about the discrete logarithm problem as we're doing here, we're going to be talking about points on a curve, and there's going to be similar rules. It's just very, very, very abstract. And this, the square and multiply algo, is going to be key to understand also when we talk about elliptic curves. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have questions. Let me know if you like this stuff. Let me know in the comments below. Give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. You're going to get regular updates on all this. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at the next episode on elliptic curves. Yours truly, Julian. Julian.